I want to welcome everybody here for this talk with Laura Whitcomb. We're, we're thrilled to have her. She's here from Los Angeles, and she's really been a, a, a pivotal figure in getting the world to know about Paulina Peavy. Uh, together with Naren, who is here, Naren Dickerson did a lot of research on this artist who was kind of known in the 30s and 40s, and then for many reasons just sort of dissolved from the art world's uh, microscope. And uh, we're really excited, and Laura, in, in addition to curating this show, uh, wrote the monograph that has finally arrived. And it's a beautiful book, we're really proud of it. She'll be happy to sign copies of it later. And uh, anyway, please welcome Laura Whitcomb. another impending storm, so I, I really uh, applaud you for persevering in attendance. It's a very special place to gather because this artist really speaks for our moment, unlike any artist I've ever really come to know. Um, we're we're in, a, in a time in our history where the American military is having disclosures of, of the existence of UAPs, which were once known as, as UFOs, and yet it isn't really even causing much ripples in the media because we're so um, acclimated to such ideas. But it is um, an interesting time in that I've always thought like every generation has their own paradigm shift. Every generation has their own revolution. And with Gen Z and, and, and the millennial generation, they really address gender. And the dissolution of the hierarchies of gender have really been um, a, a conversation and an experience for us in the last 10 years. So I think PB is an artist like no other um, in that she really speaks to our moment, yet she belongs to the 20th century. She was born in 1901 and she died at the end of the century. Just prefacing that, I, I also just wanted to first and foremost thank the gallery, Andrew Edwin, for the invitation. This has been an incredible experience working as a team to put together a book, which in, I came on in 2019, but Andrew Edwin Gallery has, has with Catherine Armstrong Laws, who has established the Paulina PD estate. They have worked tirelessly to get her um, to the point where she was recognized by the greater public. So they really need to be applauded because um, there's a great risk in taking on an artist with a controversial legacy for the commercial world, but, but also an artist that was not on the record, so to speak. So when I came along, I was deeply um, blessed because I had been working with Nuren Dickerson, and when the pandemic started, unexpectedly, I had all the Polynes masks and works on paper and manuscripts, and I was supposed to only have them for, I think, a week. And then the pandemic happened, and I, Myself, along with my two cats, had a good almost year of, of really immersing myself in Paulina. But working with Narin, uh, Narin was able to really go through the, the most obscure resources. I mean, even though everything was closed, was able to assemble a timeline that was transformative. Because when I started finding out that Paulina was showing with some of the most significant abstract artists from my research, I knew it was a game changer. And I knew this artist had a story that was really incredibly significant. So um, we will just start at the beginning. Paulina PV is born in 1901. Welcome everybody. Um, she's uh, born at high altitude in uh, Colorado Springs. And her father was struggling to take care of a young family. He was a farmer, he was a miner, he was an engineer. He was, he was anything that would pay, pay the bills and support his family. And Paulina's mother was born in Sweden, much like an artist that she's often compared to, Hilma Offerland, and we will get into that. They traveled eventually to Portland and settled there. And these are some early pictures before they left Portland of, of Colorado City. And this is a, a family portrait of Paulina, her brothers, sisters, and her father. 
Paulina, at a young age, experienced uh, a, a deeply traumatic event that would alter the course of her life. Her mother died when she was eight years old. Uh, she witnessed a very violent death. It was a miscarriage. It, 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 it went on for a, an extended period that was deeply traumatizing. Yet the family persisted. Um, the father was um, expected to raise his family on his own. And when she was 15, um, the, the family still struggling, lost their young brother, William who had um, tried to find work for the family and he was missing and then suddenly they see this notice in the paper and um, it's, it's a notice as you can see of the, of the discovery of a young boy who's found dead floating in the Columbia Slough. So it's another, another deeply traumatizing thing and this is her cherished little brother. Um, but Paulina um, is undeterred. Life is short, she decides to flourish. She, um, she becomes active in theater, she becomes class president, she, she, uh, World War I is starting and she, um, she volunteers for, the, for um, the Red Cross. She's interested in ideas of the suffragette movement and, and, um, uh, and, and just progressive ideas that were empowering to young females. And she decides that she's gonna get a higher education. She goes to a place called the Oregon Agricultural College. Now her father did not want her to have any higher education. He thought it would be wasted on girls, wasted on women. But she decided to get higher education um, a little bit far away from the family. And she went to Corvallis. And as I said, it was called the Agricultural College. But they had just opened an incredible art department. Now, in this art department, um, a man named, how am I doing this sound? Is good, it, okay, good. thank you, thank you. Um, uh, there, was, there was one of her teachers, is a man named Farley McClue, who is um, very aware of the progressive modern art movements, cubism, bordicism, uh, futurism. And um, another woman named Marjorie Bautzab, who has uh, studied at Columbia, who has studied with Archipenko, are her teachers. Mm -hmm. And this is really, uh, you know, she's immersed in like the beautiful woodlands of, of Provolis. She's, she's exposed to this incredible nature, but at the same time, she's, she's being turned on to some of the most important art movements. So you can see um, some of her early work. She's and I, and I should say that Farley um, McClough, they really wanted the, the artists, their, their students, to really survive independently, financially. And they really um, tried to steer them into commercial fields. Like, you can see what she's doing with early illustration. These are, of course, the early 20s, so she's, she's doing very playful, almost surreal juxtapositions, and she uh, obviously encompasses nature into her graphics. And of course, these bookends here, um, she was um, asked to do for, for the college. And she even, she's a runner up for the Art Students League here in New York, which is a very big deal for a student. Yes, come on in. Um, and uh, this is, this just really signifies um, that she was, she was deemed as a, a, a fresh young talent with um, great prospects and um, I, I just wanted to um, show a, a little bit more of her work early on. So she really is absorbing the stylistic trends of the time. Of course, I, I, I put the Archipanko there. Just you, you can draw your own conclusions, but I just wanted to give you an idea of exposure and, and a little bit of experimentation that she's adventuring into. Um, but she was uh, encouraged by her teacher, Farley McClough, to basically get a teaching degree. She was certainly talented enough to survive as an artist, but she agreed that she would be financially independent for the rest of her life if she could be a teacher. And um, it was one of the best decisions she ever, she ever um, partook in. And um, sadly, she does experience another trauma with Farley McClue passing away from complications of influenza. She meets a young man, Bradley Peavy, who, who's um, from a very prestigious family, and he wants to get away from his father, who wants him to become a naval cadet at Annapolis. And they travel south, and they go to San Francisco, they go to Santa Barbara, but then they settle in a place called San Pedro. Now, San Pedro is a port town in Los Angeles, 
in the 20s. It had just been ripped up of the new um, train tracks that could take you to major cities. There was huge development possibilities there. And her husband, who um, had engineering skills, and, and Paulina, uh, partnered together. She decided to um, be an architect, and she won an architecture award. Just, uh, you know, she was open to dabbling in any creative expression, and she was very successful at it. They built these three houses, which I myself have, have visited. Um, one of the women is open to doing a seance. Um, if anyone should like to, uh, I can give you her number. But, here in Los Angeles, these are some examples of her early work. I, I, I tend to um, compare it to Lionel Fenerjim. Um And also, um, this is a picture with, with Petey. Welcome, everyone. Um, with her teaching degree, she gets a job um, as the head of an art department for the San Pedro School of Arts. And with her vast skills in textiles, ceramics, graphics, uh, Batik, um, she's teaching her students a, a, a broad trajectory, but she's also invited um, to study at the Chouinard School, which is one of the most prestigious schools in Los Angeles. It's now Cal Arts. But she is meeting some really progressive artists and thinkers, and this community, um, San Pedro is getting a lot of artists that are trying to get away from the censorship issues in Los Angeles. It, it becomes a really great alternative venue for, or an alternative city for artists to, to, to live in because um, it's, it's economically viable. She's creating this really amazing network and she decides to open her own gallery and school and salon. She's meeting incredible teachers at, at the Chouinard School. She studies with a man named Morgan Russell. Now, Morgan Russell uh, established one of the first abstract American art movements called Synchromism with a, a man named Stanton McDonald Wright. And uh, Synchromism, it took a lot of cues from, from Kandinsky, the, the ideas of synesthesia, but also the harmonic fields of music, what harmony does for our souls when we listen to um, harmonic frequencies. They wanted to depict that in, in color ratios and harmonic um, frequencies of color. So PV was exposed to these really progressive ideas and she's, she actually shows the synchromists at her gallery and in her class with um, Morgan, Morgan uh, Russell, she meets uh, Mabel Alvarez, who is an esotericist. And Mabel Alvarez is an amazing um, figure that I hope will get some uh, more scholarly review in the future. But she belonged to a salon that was run by William Levington Comfort. And who should also be frequenting these salons is Agnes Pelton. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with uh, Dave Rudyard, who was um, a member of the Transcendental Painting Group, as was Agnes through association. But these are artists that are very um, closely associated with the esoteric communities that Southern California has many of in, in this time. Um, so at this time, um, PV is also exposed to another um, really important uh, legend of, of American abstract art. She is studying with Hans Hoffman, who's also teaching at Chouinard. And Hans Hoffman is um, very taken with PV and her community, and he agrees to come to San Pedro. And he's also part of this vibrant zeitgeist that's happening in San Pedro in the 20s and early 30s, and um, PV becomes his teaching assistant. So you can, you can see some of the, the directions uh, through Hoffman that she's exposed to. But at this time, an even greater influence for Southern California are the Moralistos, uh, Diego Rivera, um, Orozco, um, Sigueras. They are all coming to California. They're doing frescoes, they're doing murals, and uh, 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 even Sigueras is teaching at Chouinard. So she's exposed to these really progressive um, new directions obviously in painting, but we should also consider that the, the, the Muralistos, especially even Diego Rivera, was coming from an esoteric background. 
he, um, they had been aligned with uh, the spiritualist movements that were run by Alan Kardec. Um, Diego Rivera had painted um, the Rosicrucian Temple in Mexico City. Um, they were all illuminated by a very important philosopher um, named Jose Vasconcelos. And Jose Vasconcelos um, had written this publication called La Raza Cosmica, and it meant the cosmic race. And it was this very um, progressive idea that there would be a fusion of races, that this future race that would inhabit the planet and would, would um, signify the highest levels of consciousness would be the blending of all races. So it was a very progressive idea. And um, this is something that PV is exposed to. And she's sort of uh, picking, perhaps, and choosing into her subconscious and then blending that with the unconscious. But she's absorbing a lot of these very progressive ideas. So Southern California at this time and before is really a hotbed of uh, alternative uh, spiritual possibilities. A lot of the second generation theosophists are settling in, Cal in Southern California. Of course, we have Blavatsky, who founded Theosophy uh, here uh, with uh, Olcott and William Judge um, really promoted it through the country. And after Blavatsky died, uh, Annie Besant took over, and Charles Lindner um, was also greatly involved. Famously, they wrote a book called Thought Farms, which I'm sure many people here are familiar with. It um, was transformative. It was an idea that, you know, in, in, in the time where like Morse code and, and the telegram is, is being invented, an idea that our thoughts can travel through the ether uh, took on a, a substantive form. And this, um, this publication had uh, really influenced Kandinsky and, and Paulina was a huge fan of Kandinsky. So, Obviously, through her network of friends and teachers, she was exposed to their publication. And also, um, there's a portrait of uh, Nicholas Rores. He was also a second generation theosophist and he had founded Agni Yoga. Many of these alternative spiritualities channeled um, what they called masters, ascended masters, and often they dictated publications, some of which that we have over here. Um, above, above the ephemera case. These um, channeled works all seem to have um, a reciprocity between them. They, they spoke of ancient lands like Atlantis and Lemuria and, and beings that were pangender, that were um, and, androgyne beings. But also, as vibrant as the imaginative landscape was for um, many of these alternative spiritual, spiritual centers. Uh, they, can, can we just go back to uh, the prior image? Um, one important thing happens um, in 1929. We, we have the Wall Street crash, but also there's an ideological crash as well because Annie Besson, when she, when she took over theosophy, she wanted to represent what all of the esoteric traditions had always promised would happen that a great world teacher would, would come. And um, they met Krishnamurti um, in a beach in India as a, as a young boy. And they really decided that he was gonna be this next great world teacher. And yet it was, it was a, a, a huge pressure to put on a young man, but, but uh, they, they established the Order of the Eastern Star to announce to the world that the world teacher was coming and he would arrive. And it was a, a massive movement. However, in 1929, Krishnamurti tells everyone, you know what? I'm not your world teacher. You're your own gurus. And anyone who doesn't recognize themselves as, as their own gurus is lost. So you can imagine what happens. This is a major setback. So esotericism really needs to reevaluate itself. And it goes back to Blavatsky before she came on the scene. She was a spiritualist. And she was part of, um, she uh, participated in uh, spiritualism in, in years before she um, and her colleagues founded Theosophy. So we can go to the next slide. 
these. Um, the next one, okay, so um, in, in terms of Krishnamurti and this ideological crisis, everyone is re-exploring spiritualism, and, and also um, these Pythagorean ideas and, and what, what is called a parabola, the scientific mathematical laws that almost corroborate the unseen are being um, particularly explored by the artists. These are some early explorations of PV, uh, trying to explore higher mathematical concepts to, to convey how to uh, even open a portal into the unknown. Uh, the, the books of Uspensky are made popular and he is encouraging artists to offer gateways to uh, cross into the fourth dimension through points and lines. The, the form is very particular to engage and experience for artists, so PV is at this point exploring that. Next. Um, these are just um, some options that are also happening in Los Angeles. I'm sure you've all heard of the astroculture uh, celebrity Adamski. I mean, maybe not. Um, so, uh, so Adamski is one of the, the saucer superstars of the 1950s, but um, in, in the 20s and 30s, he was a second generation theosophist, and he uh, was in Laguna Beach, which is very close to San Pedro. He had a radio show, um, and this is Manly P. Hall, who has the Philosophical Research Society to this day. They're doing incredible programming, and, and here's the Rosicrucian Park in, in San Jose. So. California continues to team with alternative centers, um, and one of them, um, uh, I'm, uh, that's fine. <laughs> um, also, these, um, these traditions, these alternative esoteric traditions, really position women in a very powerful role. It began in spiritualism, again, probably, it goes back to the, the Delph Delphic oracles um, and, and, and the seers the prophetesses of ancient Greece and Rome, um, women became um, a better conduit to engage with, with, with the spirit world. And um, spiritualism really positioned women in this incredible role that was empowering um, and might um, very well have contributed to the, the women's rights and the suffragette movement. So in, in the late 20s and early 30s, um, Los Angeles has, I mean, assembled from McPherson. I don't know if you, the, 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 the film, um, Day of the Locust, Nathaniel Hawthorne, did you ever read it? Well, anyway, Big Mama is her. She was one of the, the big leaders with her mesmerizing uh, oracles on the radio, huge following. So there's all these examples of like uh, alternative spiritualities offering uh, new possibilities for women. PV continues to flourish. She's she's reviewed as um, you know this very successful woman. All is wonderful and all is well for her. Um, and and then, Naren. Yes. Okay. Thank you. She's also um, very good friends with this amazing um, woman. Her name's Ioni Ryder, and she runs the San Pedro Library. And they, uh, they also are doing really progressive salons. Um, PV's gallery is showing amazing artists, Lorsa Fidelson, who established um, some of the early surrealist um, explorations in California. And the San Pedro Library is also really showing a lot of progressive artists. But I want to just give you an example, because this was very um, mind-blowing research on Marin's part. Definitely was a game changer for me. Um, you can see some of the books that this library had ordered. And um, you see Annie Besant. And you see, um, I, I don't know if everybody can read that far, but there's a lot of um, material that's really important. One of which is a book called o Oaspe. Some people pronounce it Ospe. But this was um, a spiritualist book that was dictated here in New York in um, 1880 by a man named John Newbrow. And it was this cosmology of, of the arrival of Ethereum um, beings that would, would come in the next century. And it spoke of humanity operating in 12,000 year cycles. And this is important because PV will soon have a cosmology that really resonates with a lot of the ideas of uh, the Mexican muralist through Vasconcelos, through um, this 12,000 year cycle idea. 
And um, another one of these books also speaks of um, 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 a Martian engineer who's, who's looking for souls to feed the machine. So this is kind of the landscape of, of exposure for her at this time. Um, so um, she turns to some form of spiritual salvation. And obviously, theosophy is not the right road at this point in time. And she turns to spiritualism. And uh, she meets a woman named Ida Ewing, who uh, is a spiritualist. She's the head of um, the Cosmic Unity Church. And she starts bringing PV into seances. And of course, PV with losing her sister, her brother, her mother. Um, and uh, she might have really needed those people in this very difficult time that she's experiencing. So um, being able um, to, to reach um, her lost loved ones might have been a very comforting alternative. So she becomes very close to Ida Ewing. Ida Ewing becomes somewhat of a mother to her. And she starts participating in a lot of these seances. And she, next one, okay. Um, she starts, uh, she's encouraged to participate in um, a long tradition of, of women exploring um, the unknown through spiritualism. Some of these artists weren't spiritualists. Agnes Pelton is not directly a spiritualist. But um, she, she's empowered with the possibilities of being able to create a, um, a diary of her, of her experiences um, channeling. And she also is, is in, in even with an example of Agnes Pelton, Agnes Pelton is, is trying to symbolize the yantra and as an activation to raise your consciousness so that you can better convene with the unknown. But she joins a tradition of women that are, that are creating art that really um, allows almost a neuroplasticity of, of the mind to uh, experience and open channels so that they themselves can be seers and experiencers. Um, so she begins doing spirit drawings of many of the figures that she's channeling, but also I want to take a moment here to um, compare her a bit to Hilma of Klint. Um, obviously, Peavy's mother was Swedish. Um, both Hilma and Peavy had lost loved ones that drew them to spiritualism. They were both also um, guided by the being that I'm going to introduce in a second that portrayed the interdimensions as being almost plant-like forms and an interconnected vine network. So the natural world is a really important allegory in, in their work um, to convey the construction of the universe. And also, both artists uh, were engaged with the ideas of Egypt. And in Southern California, much like the Napoleonic era, there's an Egyptomania craze that's been going on forever with, with um, how, um, how Carter and Tutankhamen, which would regularly be on in, in the newspapers, the Rosicrucians had brought this huge collection from Egypt, and D.W. Griffith, and, and Here's um, some of the architecture at Loma Land. Egypt is really um, the, the archetype of, of the lost civilization that um, everyone yearns to return to. So Ida Ewing channels um, an, an entity, a discarnate entity named La Como, who identifies as um, being pharaonic, coming from other worlds, and also being interdimensional. And uh, also being an androgyne, not being not belonging to any gender, and I, I I find it also interesting because Egypt is so underscored in her and her community's cosmology that in Egypt um, Queen Hatshepsut had been given a beard and Akhenaten IV had been given a tiny waist and just almost like minute breasts. So this idea of pharaohs being pangender kind of permeated the imagination. So PV starts uh, channeling, um, uh, as she's channeling um, Lacomo independently, she's also uh, doing these spirit drawings, which are starting to get attention. 
And um, this is another uh, spirit drawing. She was invited to show at a number of important galleries, uh, one of which was um, a department store in San Francisco that actually was of the very prestigious to show in Gumps. Uh, and this is a, a photo of her teaching. Next one. Uh, she's invited to uh, show at the Stendhal Gallery, which is in Los Angeles. And Earl Stendhal was uh, very supportive of, of women, but this is where um, uh, the Blue Four, like uh, Kandinsky, was was really first introduced through um, the introductions of a woman named Galka Shire. It was where uh, he showed Picasso's Guernica, and this was the Gallery of Los Angeles. So it's a very um, important inclusion that uh, PD showed there. She also met a fascinating woman um, that I hope has more scholarship on, a woman named Alma Reed. Alma Reed had the Delphic Studios uh, here in New York, and she was, she was part of this interconnected network of esotericists um, from uh, Greece where she participated in um, the, the, the revival of, of Delphi there. She was the patron of Orozco. She was originally from San Francisco, but, um, and, and uh, she established this incredible gallery. She showed Agnes Pelton two years before she showed PV. And so PV's um, really, through, by taking agency of this, this um, new direction in her life, she, she's really finding a strong community that's recognizing her as being an authentic seer. So um, again, these are some of um, PB's early work that she is showing in. Uh, she also shows uh, next one. Um, she shows at uh, the San Francisco Museum of Art, which is being directed by this incredible woman named Grace Morley, and Grace McCann Morley, and she um, is friends with um, Barr at the Museum of Modern Art here. And she encourages him to let her borrow some of the shows that um, are at MoMA, and they come to California. And she has she's very interested in exposing and giving exposure to the surrealists. But PB is included in one of the first shows at SF. Um, it was called the San Francisco Museum of Art, and then it became Modern Art. But but she is um, shown at that time. Now, getting back to the discarnate entity that um, PV is regularly commuting with, named Lacomo. Lacomo is offering this incredible experience for PV, um, explaining this alternate cosmology of how the universe is um, constructed, and it's something that's very healing for her. So, getting back to this idea of how I kind of wrote this book for the non-believer and the believer. For the non-believer, I think it's a, a, it's a very fascinating um, example of how our brains react to trauma in, in incredibly different ways, but there's a self-vivid mechanism that creates a narrative through the imagination that the, the traumas that you have experienced were for a greater meaning. They were small sacrifices because your purpose in this world is um, to be a conduit or a participant for a, a higher agenda, almost like an ideation of a, a world savior. So um, PV is, uh, she decides she's going to be a prophet of these very interesting concepts that um, Lacamo had of, of um, a 12,000 year cycle broken down into four seasons. And in these four seasons, genders um, mutate and change. But ultimately, the greatest season is the summer season where it's the androgyne. And it's, it's definitely a, a, a goddess female race that um, dissolves all war. And, um, and these are cycles that don't necessarily corroborate with the architectural, I mean, the archaeological record, but um, they also are just allegories of, of, of broader concepts, time and space. So um, PV is really seeing herself as a conduit of, of Lacamo, and her, her paintings, um, Lacamo uh, guided her to reevaluate the Bible. And the Bible had to be reevaluated because it was this patriarchal misappropriation. 
And all of the figures of the Bible needed to be re-examined through the lens of their connection to the Pharaonic age, um, uh, higher states of consciousness in Egypt. And she starts also, um, these figures, she, she starts taking these ideas of, of uh, pan-racial attributes, blending the races, and also gender. So what she was working on was pretty much an attack on um, the Western Judaic tradition, but for a curator at what became um, one of the most exciting events for California, which was the Golden Gate International Exposition. It was a World's Fair that was trying to compete with um, the New York World's Fair. Uh, some of the most uh, important artists at the time were going to uh, participate. Of course, Diego Rivera came up with um, Frida Kahlo and uh, participated, but they created um, in this World's Fair city a place called the Temple of Religion. Now the Temple of Religion brought in uh, ancient um, religious artifacts, but also they thought PB was a modernist who was kind of modernizing the religious tradition. They had no idea that her um, her paintings, many of which um, are in the, in the back room and on the walls here, um, many of these paintings were attacking um, the, the fundamental ideas of the religious tradition. So when all of her work was exposed, uh, she really um, uh, received a bit of a backlash, somebody threw eggs, um, but she, uh, we can go to the next one. This is a very important um, uh, thing uh, that I should have um, commented earlier about. PV is unlike any uh, spiritual artist before her. She was guided by Lacomo to paint layers incrementally over a period of 50 years. Each layer, the first being recontextualizing biblical figures, would be given layers over time, um, each having a different message. So it was an experience for both her and the public to slowly and incrementally be transformed through viewing the works. So getting back to um, these images that we have here, the uh, many artists starting um, even as, as far as uh, illuminated manuscripts, William Blake, the Salon de la Vorose Croix, um, auric fields are, are often um, surrounding uh, figures that uh, are, that are uh, generally painted in the esoteric tradition. And this really cr um, corroborates a lot of the scientific advances to, to telegraphic discoveries. So science and esotericism, they're both corroborating each other. So a lot of artists are explore, exploring vibrational frequencies and fields, of which the first layers of her paintings do. So next one. Um, this is um, a really great opportunity to see PB's works because all of the paintings that we have here have received 50 years, uh, possibly 50 years of incremental layers. So this is what the work looked like in the beginning of, the, of her gestational stages. Uh, she begins another um, religious uh, work. She paints um, the, um, the Last Supper and she does um, uh, a pan-gender and um, biracial Christ. And of course, this is shown in San Diego, which is one of the most more conservative um, cities in Southern California. This doesn't go over very well with the public, but I, she's undeterred. She's um, serving, um, um, her art is serving um, an evolution of consciousness, so she carries on. Uh, so um, PV is receiving backlash. Uh, she's protesting war in general, and America is starting to consider answering um, World War II. She's told uh, she has been supporting herself as as a as a teacher. Uh, she's teaching in San, San Pedro in the high schools in Long Beach, and they threaten to take away or, or they they threaten to um, uh, that she might lose her teaching license if she protests the war. So she's running into some issues in Southern California. Just real quickly, this is just an example of what the Last Supper looked like at the end of her career. Well, not at the end, but like this is an example of how she would transform 
her religious uh, subjects into very abstract, concrete forms. So at this time, um, there's there's this uh, rahura of uh, like uh, UFO sightings. This is before Roswell. It, it makes the, the papers in Los Angeles, and, and PV accounts that she, Lacamo, uh, is a being that can um, transform into uh, a spacecraft. So, <laughs> um, and this is um, the, the, the higher forms of transmutation that, that there's a seamlessness between these, these ascended masters and their ability to appear to what uh, the public desires them to be. So, next one. So, PD decides to leave Los Angeles. She's being threatened um, to lose her teaching credentials, and she um, wants to come to a city that has a more inviting milieu. And um, as World War II is beginning, uh, there's an incredible exodus of some of the most um, prolific surrealist artists. Andre Breton has, has arrived, Roberto uh, Mata, and, and Max Ernst. Um, and, and they are exploring occultism. And, and although they have, have already explored occultism, they're doing it um, with more frequency, believing that the Third Reich themselves were exploring occultism. And it's almost like they were trying to maybe throw a little white magic back at what was happening um, in Europe. But it's a very productive time, and obviously you can see influences that are coming into her own oeuvre. This is a, a, a PV's exploring um, works of Smokey's Fumage, which Wolfgang Pauline was exploring. Now, it's 1947 and everything changes. Roswell arrives. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. It's it's I. Let's go back to yours. It's 1945, and um, the bombs of um, Hiroshima um, and, and Nagasaki occur. And this is just one of the most devastating things that she has experienced. And the fact that all scientific progress has just sought um, a direction to to dismantle humanity altogether. So she starts really focusing her anger on the male sex. And this portrait of Adam, who is, um, it's the idea of the splitting of the Adam that she is using as a parable in, in this uh, particular portrait. Um, next one. So um, she decides to really voice herself. She's writing all kinds of manuscripts and teaching didactics, and um, she's trying to let the world know that radiation is you know, causing cancer. Everything that's happening, Lacoma wants her to let the masses understand like how dangerous this splitting of the atom is and what terrible we are in, um, as a human race. Next one. So um, this is um, the moment that I really um, wanted to explain. So in 1947, Roswell happens. And of course, it arrives through the newspapers. Um, the, the media just goes bananas over it. And, um, but what is happening that a lot of people don't understand is Roswell was the site of um, the the stations that had bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, a lot of the bombardiers were stationed at Roswell. So isn't it interesting that if, um, if, if uh, beings from another world would have, would have come, are they not sending a message that they came to Roswell? So that's something, obviously, for the believer to, to chew on. But so another, uh, another issue which underscores the possibility of why these visitors came at this particular time after the splitting of the atom had done its severe damage is the idea of quantum entanglement. I'll be really brief with this, but it's the idea that in the splitting of the atom, you have an electron um, going in one direction, but at the furthest re reaches of space, that, that electron will mimic the movement of the electron that is here, billions and billions and billions of light years away. So, according to the laws of quantum entanglement, um, 
we were affecting the universe at large, interdimensionally and throughout space-time. So there was reasons for this presence, reason to find um, artists that could be vehicles to illuminate the public to our misguided ways. Next one. So astroculture has arrived, but astroculture technically has been around for a while. I mean, there's biblical accounts of the wheels of Ezekiel. There's, there's I mean, Rome uh, accounts of like Thomas and Serranos sightings. I mean, it runs through the, the, the Middle Ages. But Jules Verne really gave it amplitude through um, science fiction. And in um, uh, the 1890s, there was this phenomenon of mystery airships that were accounted for all over California. So um, the cultural landscape was very familiar with the possibilities of Ethereum beings arriving. But after Roswell, there's a rupture, a philosophic rupture, because this discredits all uh, re religious traditions. So the esotericists um, come on board, and many of them become astroculture philosophers and leaders. And many of the um, astroculture figures of this time were former theosophists and spiritualists. So it's a really interesting thing that the philosophies of the esoteric tradition um, really segue very seamlessly into um, reasons and ways of communing with, with um, this new age. Next one. Um, so PB understands that as um, a devotee and an, instru an instrument of Lacomo, Lacomo, that she herself needs to really participate in this astrocultural zeitgeist. And she becomes um, a, a celebrity herself. She is um, documented in this book, The Age of Flying Saucers. She becomes involved with a man named Albert Bender. And if, if anyone has ever sort of dived into the darker side of the astroculture world, he would um, be a good example in that he was one of the first contactees that claimed he was being followed by men in black. And um, I mean, it, it was this very kind of paranoid atmosphere that involved just military hesitance to see, see anything, any information released to the public. And it was a very um, caustic, terrifying time um, for, for both sides because, of course, the government didn't want this kind of threat. But also, um, uh, for uh, astroculture voices, they started to really um, feel the wrath of censorship. And PV is no longer so welcome to show at the galleries that she had had relationships with. So she um, starts to um, really throw herself into manuscripts and, and, and becoming, almost branding herself in this way of a, a new body of exposure. And she, she um, is considered an emissary for Bender. And then everything kind of folds. Um, next one. And this is um, some more examples. She's uh, established the La Camo Gallery here in New York, which is in her apartment because um, she feels that she doesn't need the commercial art world. And she, she thrives in her own way. She also starts creating a lot of didactics for teaching um, her art. And this particular one is um, mannequin art, which is in, um, we have one of the mannequins that she created. But this teaching didactic shows the idealization of the androgyne, um, which also is an allegory of the pharaoh, um, as, as um, a way to uh, learn sort of um, the underlying um, mathematical meanings to um, the, the idealized form of the androgyne, which echoes many of the alchemical traditions that um, see the androgyne or the hermaphrodite merge as the, the highest um, form before transmutation. So the, the, these ideas have a lot of circularity between the ancient and the modern, but we'll move on. So PV with her incredible skills, she had learned costume design and fashion um, and always created, uh, on many occasions, created her own outfit. She's working 
for some of the fashion houses here in New York. She's doing theater sets and, and her works on paper really show a flair um, that could, um, could cross over into fashion. Next one. Um, so to commune with um, Lacamo, she would create masks um, and the ceremony of communing with her, her master and teacher would um, just be a ceremony um, into itself. But she wanted to represent the trajectory of humanity. It wasn't cultural appropriation where you, know, you see the mask in the, in, the, in, the, in the back room. It was representing all um, walks of humanity for um, a being that was not of this world. So she, she explores all cultures. She even um, creates this sticky tape um, um, that she copyrights to keep your mask on. So it's <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, so we'll go to the next one. So these are some of the, the masks. Um, I'm sorry if, if we can sort of shrink this a little bit. Yeah, there we go, there we go. Perfect. That's what we needed to do. So uh, these are uh, obviously some of her masks, and she's living close to the fashion district. So she, like the haberdashery shops, like would have been incredible um, to say the least. Uh, and she, uh, let's go to the next one. She also, as a newfound astrocultural celebrity, participates on a, radio, a popular radio show called uh, Long John Neville. And it's a late night radio show, but it's hugely popular and influential on mass culture. And here she does some promotions for it. She shows her masks. She stands in front of one of her paintings and one of her custom made um, gowns. And it's, it's one of the few photos of her, so we really cherish it. Uh, so after World War II, there was a project that was started by a man named uh, Raymond Piper. And he had this very ambitious idea to write a book about cosmic art. And he, he like, like many of the artists reacting to the devastations of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he wanted to assemble all of the artists that could return humanity to, um, uh, to a, a, a spiritual realm that would, would heal us from, from um, the tragedies that had occurred. And I don't, I mean, obviously, I'm sure the audience can't see this, but I mean, he assembled all of the transcendentalists, the surrealists, the, the progressive uh, cubists from around the world to participate in this project. And um, he saw PV as one of the most important um, artists to include in this project. And uh, she would have obviously been included with some uh, well-known artists, but he, he sadly died before uh, Cosmic Art could be finished. But uh, a person that um, came in to the, uh, um, the scenario to, to, to complete the project was a fascinating human being named Ingo Swan. Ingo Swan was um, one of the forefathers of rem remote viewing. He was a psychic. He um, was such a recognized psychic and a visionary artist as well. And before I forget, lived here on the Bowery about six blocks down, a figure of the Bowery. He um, was conscripted by the CIA during Project Stargate because they believed the, the Soviet Union was using mind control as a weapon. And Igo Swan, you know, controversially is, is working for the industrial military complex but he is also um, this incredible visionary painter that is taking on this really Im um, important project to complete it. And he accomplishes that. So um, uh, this is the first time PV is really um, contextualized um, in terms of her impact in her community. I, I encourage um, those to investigate the project down the line. And, and I have to just quickly say that it was very interesting during the pandemic to go to the, where this archive is kept. It's at the University of West Georgia in the Newt Gingrich um, 
Uh, yes. So, it, it, but it was it was it was one of the most incredible archives, and um, I'm, I'm, I was really thankful for that experience to to come across so much material there. Next one. Um, Pinky's also working um, as a uh, as a drafts person. She's working for um, design firms, architectural graphic arts firms in in New York, and she's exploring these ideas of mathematics as a way to convey ancient esoteric language. And she starts exploring somography. And uh, from the beginning, I mean, uh, somography and, and um, stitching techniques that were popularized at the time by an artist like Sue Fuller were having a popular um, zeitgeist, but at the same time, they, they have a very important tradition um, among um, esotericism. And Peavy starts creating works on paper that are that combine often um, watercolor collage, but these lecture sets that almost offer cartographic portals or maps to cross to within our own unconscious or um, space time itself. There, there. I view them myself as as, and these are all the works on the wall over here. The works on paper. Um, the, the cinegraphs really um, are an, a really important uh, skill development that she embodies at this time. Now, um, she's also using very interesting signs and almost um, sometimes astrological numbers and codes. It's a way to configure coordinates of how to possibly cross space time. Uh, Obviously, they, they would need a great deal more study, but, but they are a very um, fascinating dynamic in her works on paper. We can go to the next one. Uh, you can see many of them here. And um, even um, getting into the tradition of somebody back in um, uh, Hildegard von Bingen who had the lingua ignota, uh, these ideas of um, ascetic writing, of secret codes and, and secret language were, were, were very um, a productive interest amongst astroculture because viewers had seen hieroglyphic signs on the crashed spacecraft at Roswell. So the astroculture community was very interested in these um, glyph forms. Next one. Uh, this is um, a really good example from a lot of the astroculture literature where you can see even Adamski explores space language and, and, and this idea of writings from inter, interplanetary communications coming through these signs and glyphs um, are really embedded into her work at this time. Next one. So coming on the late 60s and early 70s and moving into the 80s, astroculture is considered a little bit more acceptable. Uh, uh, Kubrick has 2001 Space Odyssey. There's Eric von Donegan, who's um, putting out these ideas of ancient aliens. Film is an incredible means to convey her complex cosmology. So she engages in creating her own films, which are almost like a documentary style. She really chooses enchanting music, uh, that spans Balinese gamelan to new electronic music. And, and uh, film really allows her to elucidate the intentions and her philosophies in a way like none other. Uh, next one. And these are just some still images where she often uh, puts a, a lot of these works in rotation. She created many works to just for the films alone that still exist. We'll go to the next one. And then going back to this idea of PV um, needing to, uh, through um, Lacomo, uh, create these in messages through incremental stages. The final stage would be the crystals. And it's such a fascinating thing because crystals themselves emit a sound frequency. And she had always recorded that she would experience Lacomo through frequencies and, and through sound vibration. And also getting into the ancient um, ideas of Lemuria and Atlantis, there was a, a notion that was revived in sort of the Alice Bailey New Age period where 
um, the crystals would encode all the lost wisdom from prior civilizations. And crystals themselves are these universal ideas of the wisdom of all of the cycles of, the, of an evolution of the past, that these crystals activate as a universal symbol and that will embed within you the wisdom that they are trying to convey as the final phase of the painting. Um, next one. So, uh, so here she is at her um, <laughs> Lacomo Gallery in her home, and it's very salon style, as you can see. And she begins writing uh, a diary, the story of my life with a UFO, where she really interestingly um, dives into her cosmology a bit with, with even a greater force. Uh, this obviously is addressing her issues with um, the, the Babel era of of, of men and the, the lineages and predilections to war that she's taking male genitalia and echoing it as the canon. So, you know, this gives you a sense of, of PV would have still not probably have been welcomed among um, polite society, but, um, <laughs> um, but she um, just did not compromise. Next one, and we're, we're almost getting to the end here. Um, I just wanted to, um, I didn't really um, talk enough about Hilma F. Clint and Agnes Pelton, but uh, similarities between Hilma F. Clint, as I mentioned before, are the vine-like forms, um, forms of nature that really illustrate um, the unseen worlds. And another um, frequented um, image of these paintings, which is on the cover of the book, is the eye. And the eye, um, as a circular shape, represents the eye of Ra, this archetype of the saucer. It's, it's this continuous form that she would really come to fixate upon. But it also was important in that for PB, the highest form of experience, of the lived experience, is the miracle of creation. So the eye also has the same form as the, the basic form of um, primal life. And um, if we could go to the next one. So these forms that she's really focusing on are gestational forms of life that she has a very meditative focus towards the end of her life. But getting back to the eye of Ra and the cell of creation, um, it, it also, um, represents for her the power of the ovum, which is another female empowerment narrative. So some of the last works that she would work on are the phantasmas, and one of them is sitting behind me here. And obviously it is a meditation on the, the, the power of the ovum and, and, and the sanctity of creation. And yeah, and um, getting back to also some more comparisons of this um, vegetative nature really exemplifying interdimensional life is uh, Georgiana Hodson, who was one of the first spiritualist artists, and it, it's interesting to see their work together. And one more, I think. Yes, so again, um, what I was speaking about with the cell of creation, the power of the ovum, the, the gestational um, miracles of life are also um, explored by other artists, of course, Helma F. Clint and Italo Pompun. Uh, and so this, this is something that many um, female artists um, are, are drawn to uh, sometimes at the closures of their career. Um, is there another one? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, we'll end with the eye, and we'll end with Andrew giving, giving me the eye. No. no. <laughs> I just want to thank you for Aww. this captivating talk. Aww.